Okay, so thanks everyone who was able to make it to today's meetup. Uh, today we talked about uh, working with files in Python. So we got uh, far enough into the material that we can open up a file, we can read from the contents of the file, uh, but we didn't get a chance to write to a file, append to the file, tell where we are in the file, stuff like that. Uh, but we got the basics down, and that took us about an hour, hour and 15 uh, minutes to do so. So I'll move through the material a little bit quicker, hopefully, uh, so that you can uh, get it, but you have the ability, obviously, to pause. So if I bring up my desktop, and I have done this video twice because I have some fat fingers today. All right, there we go. So programming intro five, which is just the fifth group of material we've covered. And we'll talk about file modes, file descriptors. How do we open and close a file? How do we read from the file once we've opened it? Uh, and then again, in a later meetup, we'll talk about writing to a file, appending to a file, and figure out our position within the file, right? First thing is file modes. So when we open a file, there's different modes that we have to be concerned with. Are we reading from it? Are we writing to it? Do we need to append to it? Is this a binary file or a text file, right? These are considerations that Python needs to know, right? Uh, if we open it in read mode, it's going to expect that, okay, there's contents there. I'm going to be able to read from it, stuff like that. But if we open it in write mode, if the file exists currently, it's going to overwrite the contents, right? So this is an easy way for us to, you know, blow away a file and, you know, mess something up. So we got to be careful about that. Uh, if the file doesn't exist, it's going to go ahead and create it, right? And then as we write to it, the actual writing doesn't typically take place until we close the file. And then it flushes all of those things that we've written to it to the file, right? So if we've opened the file, we wrote to it, and then we go to check the contents of it uh, and we haven't closed it, there's probably nothing there to kind of look at, right? So we have to close the file, then we can reopen it for read and see that, oh, well, there are you know things here to look at. When we open it in append mode, if the file currently exists, it opens it and moves all the way to the end of the file. So when we start writing, it does in fact append it to the end of the file. If the file doesn't exist, pretty sure uh, Python also just goes and creates the file, right? And we could test that out. Um, but like I said, we're not gonna get to the point of writing to a file during this meetup. Uh, we kind of got bogged down in reading from it, right? There's a lot of things that we could cover there. And then this last one is binary file, right? So by default, Python's going to assume that we're working with text files, uh, you know, stuff that's going to be definitely easily readable by us humans, uh, but not necessarily, you know, uh, a picture or, you know, executable or some other binary format, right? So when we open those sorts of things, we need to indicate that, hey, open it in binary mode. Uh, and so, Put a little B in there and we'll be good. All right, file descriptors. So file descriptors, when we open a file, what actually gets assigned to the variable that, that you know we give this to is a file descriptor. So on a standard system, so I'm sitting on a Linux machine right now, right? That is my operating system. Standard in, right? So things that I'm reading from, like the console, that's considered uh, file descriptor zero. Uh, whereas when I write to the screen, that's typically file descriptor one, right? And then if my program errors in some way and I write to standard error, that's typically file descriptor two. So you won't necessarily see file descriptor zero, one, and two used for the files that we'll work with. It'll start you know, using numbers for files, you know, like three, four, five, depending upon how many files we have open on our machine. Okay, now from the standpoint of Python, we really don't see file descriptors used too much as far as the actual numbers, but understand under the hood, that's how things are being done. Okay, so opening and closing a file, right? So there are two ways that we can open this. So on the left here, I have the standard kind of open function, right? So if I bring up my pen here, 
I have this open function, right? And the first thing I'm going to pass to it is the file name. So this is the actual file on my machine that I'm going to read from. And so in my case, there's this uh, file called hosts. It's in a folder called Etsy. So Etsy hosts. And so I'm going there and opening that file. So what mode am I opening it in? So that's where the mode comes into play. And so in my case, I'm just going to read from it, right? I don't want to overwrite the contents for some reason. So I'm just opening it in read mode. So once the open function is run and this file exists and I'm allowed to do this to it, right? What gets passed here to this variable called host file is a file descriptor, right? So this is a stored in here is a file descriptor. Now, again, this is Python. So everything in Python is an object. So I don't necessarily need to know that under the hood, there's a file descriptor stored in here. Instead, I can start calling the methods for a file object, right? So this gives me a file object that I can now call methods for. So in this case, I'm going to call read. Now read, as we'll find later, just reads in the entire contents of the file all at one time, right? And so because I've opened this in read mode, and because by default, it's gonna assume this is a text file, what I should expect to see is what gets assigned now to this variable called hosts is a string of the entire contents of this file, right? So now that I've read from it, I need to close it, right? So this is just good programmer etiquette that, hey, if I'm going to open a file, go ahead and close it before my program exits. Or once I'm done utilizing the file, go ahead and close it, right? Now, if I didn't do that, in my case, when the program finishes execution, right? So my program is done running, it's going to notice this is out there as it deletes and removes this uh, file object, it will go ahead and close it for me. However, again, good programmer etiquette says that I should close the file before uh, once I'm done using it, essentially. Now, if this was a running program that stays running all the time, runs in the background on my machine, I might end up with a bunch of file descriptors getting used up because I'm not closing all of you know the files that I'm reading from. And that could start to cause issues with my machine. So again, this is good programmer practice to always close the file when you're done working with it. So I mentioned there were two ways of opening a file. So this was uh, method one. This is method two. And it uses something called a context manager. Right, And this is a special thing in Python that allows some extra functionality to kind of be built into uh, what we or what we essentially use inside the context manager. Now, given a file or a file descriptor, the context manager knows that, hey, when I'm done utilizing this thing, I will automatically close it. So you don't see this host file dot close because it automatically happens once we exit this block, right? So we have the indention here, just like we've seen in our other Python programs, like our functions, uh, our loops, we have our colon at the end, right? So this is the block of code. Once we're done running this block of code and we come back out here, it's gonna go ahead, the context manager is gonna go ahead and close the file for us, right? So super handy. And this is typically how you'll see uh, Python programmers. When you're just going to kind of open a file, read from it, write to it, do something very quick, you'll typically see them do it in this manner. So they don't have to remember that, oh, I need to close the file. Now, if you're going to have it open for a long point of time because you're doing things in your program, you may find that this works better here on the left, right? And then you just have to remember that you're the one that's going to have to close them, right? So again, we still use open, we still pass in the file name, we still pass in our mode, and the, the syntax change is we use with in front of it, and then as after it, okay? 
So where this was run before, and it basically passed in our file object to host file, this does the same thing. This host file is now our file object. And so we can utilize it in the same way. I can call methods off of that uh, file object. In this case, I called read, which reads the entire contents in. In this case, I call read lines, which does the same thing, but it essentially, instead of returning a long string, it returns a list of each of the lines. And we'll talk about that here in a second. The thing that I want you to understand is that there are two ways for us to do it. I can basically do everything manually myself, where I open it, I read from it, and then I close it or I use the context manager so that I'm opening it, I'm reading from it, but the context manager now closes the file for me. And then here at the end, I'm just printing out the thing that I read in. So printing out host, printing out host. So these will result in the same exact uh, output. Uh, well, actually not, because this one does read lines. So I'll get a list of the lines coming out. This one will be a string. Um, but again, on the left here, close it yourself. On the right here, the context manager will close it for you. All right, so let's go to the next slide and we'll see what those reads actually look like. So, oops, moved off my screen. There we go. The drawing showed up on my wrong screen, but hey. All right, so we have two methods that we'll talk about for reading from a file. One is read and one is read lines. All right. So the difference being that read reads the entire contents of the file and stores it as a string. Now, instead of reading the entire contents of a file, if I pass in a number, that will read X number of, in this case, because I'm opening them uh, as text files, it's probably gonna line up with the number of characters. But one of the things we talked about during our meetup is that not all languages are the same, right? Obviously, and not all languages use the same characters in their language, obviously. Um, and because of that, we can find ourselves in a scenario where it's not the number of characters, we should actually call this the number of, if I could write better, bytes, right? So this is actually the number of bytes that we're gonna read. But typically when we're re reading from ASCII text files, we'll find that it, it lines up with the number of characters. Now, I mentioned this thing called ASCII, right? So during our meetup, uh, I brought up my terminal. And on my terminal, I have something installed that's the ASCII program. And so if I bring it up, it gives me this crazy looking chart of ASCII values, right? And so if I notice here at the top, I have a decimal heading, I have a hexadecimal uh, heading, and I have, let me make sure, there we go and I have some type of value. Let me erase that. Now, if we notice here, we can see that we do, in fact, have certain characters. And so character A is often represented as 65 decimal or 41 hexadecimal. So it's the same number, it's just how we represent it, right? But all of these characters have some sort of associated value. And so the typical alphabet that us English speakers kind of use, the, the character sets that go along with it, they only go up to 127. Why is that important? Well, 127 uh, is uh, in our binary pattern is seven ones, All right? Now we haven't covered binary in any of our other meetups, but understand that this is actually two to the zero power. This is two to the first power, and this is not gonna work in how I stacked all these. This is two to the second power, so on and so forth, right? When we add them all up, 
it will come out to 127. And so we figured out, uh, I say we, not me, uh, that I can represent all of these English characters by going up to 127. Well, in computers, one byte is actually eight bits. And so we find that the first bit for the typical ASCII chart is always zero. And then we have seven bits after here to use. And depending upon which of those bits you set, you come up with uh, different numbers, right? And so that essentially indicates, you know, the character that we want. And the reason I say all of this, right, is do you see uh, any of the character sets that you would expect to see in Japanese, in Chinese, in Russian, you know, a lot of different languages that are, you know, out there. Um, but those character sets don't exist in here. And so we had to come up with a new way of doing things. Um, and, and so instead of this ASCII, which is like the American standard character or something, uh, anyway, they came up with something called Unicode. And so Unicode is a multi-byte character format, right? So I need to store numbers that are higher than 127. You have all your emojis and stuff like that. Well, they go to, you, you have all these things that we need to represent. And so these multi-code things, I may need to read in 65,000 different characters, right? And so Unicode allows us to do that. And so long story short, the whole reason for bringing this up is because of that, we can't necessarily say that, oh, number of characters, bytes. They don't always line up, right? And so in our case, when we're reading ASCII files, that will in fact be the case, uh, but other files could be stored in Unicode. And so reading one byte won't necessarily equal one character. It's a portion of a character. And so we may have to read in two bytes you know, in order to be able to figure out what that character is. So just recognize that. Didn't hit that too hard during our meetup, but that does happen, right? Read lines. Now, read lines is going to read in the entire uh, contents of the file, but instead of storing it as a string, it's going to store it as a list of the lines in that file. Now, how does it break up the, the lines of the file? Well, we see this slash n, right? So down here, I did a read lines. And that read lines uh, essentially pulled in each line of the file. And notice at the end of each of these entries, each of these strings, I have a slash n, right? And so essentially, this is the file that this is stored in saying this is the a new line, right? So if I go back to uh, my chart again, I can see that, uh, let's see, I think it is this one right here. So a 10 equates to a line feed, right? And so this is the new line character. And so if I look, uh, this was what we were looking at, Etsy hosts. If I cat out Etsy hosts, I'll find that what I have is 127.001, some space, local host, and then I go to a new line. So in my file, notice I have 127.001 slash T, which is the tab character. That's where that, that little bit of white space was. And then localhost and then slash n because that was the end of the line that went down to here. Then I have colon, colon, one, colon, colon, one, slash t, slash t. So that's all this white space right there. Localhost slash n. So that's the end of this line and it breaks down. Then 127. And then the name of my 
machine or my operating system, right? So that's my operating system's name. Local domain is just something. That's the name of my machine. And so what we see is 127.11, my machine, all that kind of stuff, right? And then slash n. So there is a carriage return then, or not a carriage return, a new line going from here down to there, right? And so what we're seeing is this read lines automatically breaks anytime it sees a slash n and starts a new string. And so we end up with a list of all the individual lines, right? So that's the difference. This would be one big string here on the left, whereas on the right here, it's a list of the strings that are on each line, right? So nothing too difficult. Just understand that's the difference between how read works and read lines works, all right? So we jumped into some challenges and this is essentially where we ended off, right? So this is where we kind of, you know, burnt a lot of our time today. So the first one we're gonna read uh, with a descriptor. We're gonna then try a context manager. Then we're gonna read line by line to see what that looks like. And then we're gonna start to work with it in a way that allows us to determine the file type of something that we're given, okay? So let's, uh, I think I have my browser open. Yep, so we used REPL.IT because I figured that was easiest for everyone to work with, especially when you start looking at uh, where did I save this file at? How do I execute this file? Once we start meeting in person, this will become a little bit easier, but essentially, we're gonna just kind of work through it together here. So I'm gonna upload a file and I've got main one, okay? So I'll go ahead and rename this one just to main, right? So that uh, I can use the run button. The run button doesn't work if uh, this it doesn't have a file called main.py. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is open readfile.txt and save the descriptor. So I probably should upload uh, that file as well. So I have this read file. So now I have a text file here and I have my Python program. So let's go ahead and we're just gonna save off the file descriptor. So let's call this my file and we'll do an open. And now I need to indicate where the file is and what the file is called. Well, because it's right next to my main.py file, meaning they're in the same folder, uh, I can just, put the file name. Otherwise, maybe I had downloaded it. So this would be uh, on, I'm on a Linux machine. So this curly thing just means my home folder. And this would be downloads and then whatever the file was called. Again, in my case, this read file.txt is in the same folder as my main. So I'm just gonna do read file.txt, right? And I could even get more specific and I could do a dot slash. So it's definitely looking in the folder that I'm currently standing in. But for now, that's overkill. Read file dot text is what we'll do. Now, I have to specify a mode. Now, if I don't specify one, it's just going to assume I'm trying to read from the file. And we can test that. So we'll just do it that way. So I've opened the file. We're going to read in contents. So contents equals my file dot read all right so i'm calling the read method on it i'm going to go ahead and close it so my file dot close so i call now the close method and then print the contents so print contents now if i'm right that by default that opens in read mode for a text file what we should see is we do in fact get the contents of the file. I bet you can't read me from Python. And if we look, that is what was in the file, right? So we've got the entire contents of the file read out. We didn't specify the mode, but we probably should. Just to be on the safe side, we'll do it as R. And if we click run, I get the same exact thing. Now, we can look and look at the type for contents. So I'm just gonna print out 
the type for contents. And when I run it, I will see that it is in fact a string, right? So class stir. So using the read method read in the entire contents of the file as a single string, right? And that's all we had to do for this first one. Open the file, read from it, close the file, and go ahead and print out its contents. So pretty easy. Now the second one is a little bit different. So if I delete this, I'm gonna go ahead and upload main.2. I will go ahead and rename this to just main. And what we'll see is now instead of doing the open that we did before, we're gonna go ahead and use our context manager. So we'll start it with with, as, I'm gonna call this thing secret file. So read in the contents of the file here. So the same exact thing we did before, right? Contents equals secret file dot read. And now print the context of the file or contents of the file. So content, let's just do print contents. And if I run it, I get the exact same output, right? So pretty easy. The only thing that in this case we had to do was, and this was kind of already done for us, is the context manager uses this with syntax. We have an as out here. This is what we're going to call it. So when we use it down here, we use that same name. We call the read method and the rest is history, right? So that was a pretty easy one. If you did the first one, the second one should come pretty easy. Okay, third one. So if we upload main.3, all right, let me go ahead and get rid of this main here. Delete. We'll rename this guy. All right. And let's see. This time, uh, we actually have to write out that with syntax. So pretty easy in this case again. So with open, uh, not main.py, how about read file.txt. We're going to open it in read mode again as, and we'll call this thing my file again. Now we're going to read the contents of the file line by line. Really, it's we're going to say lines equals uh, my file dot read lines, right? So we're not necessarily reading it line by line, but what we end up with is a list of each of the lines. And if I if I do like a block comment here, which is not what we should be doing, but hey, we'll say uh, print type lines and then we'll print lines i'll save that so what we should see is i want to know the type of this thing that gets returned to us and i want to print out what its actual contents are so if i hit run what we'll see is we got a list back instead of a string and each of these are the individual lines. So notice it ends in slash n, right? We have a slash n for the second line because it essentially didn't have anything there. So it just did a new line to the next. Uh, we have our line again. Notice it also ends in slash n, so on and so forth. Okay, so we know we're getting a list back. And we know that each one of those strings has a new line character on it. And so I've already pre-written this uh, for uh, our STEM club, but essentially when I run it here, this is what I should expect, is I have each of the individual lines and a number indicating the line that it came from, right? So just a nicer formatted kind of thing that gives me some output. But let's talk about what we see here, all right? so. 
There's a function here, doesn't isn't particular to reading and writing to files, but it's something new, so let's talk about it. So we have this enumerate function. This enumerate function takes some type of iterable, right? Something that I can iterate over, go, you know, some, you know, one thing after the next thing, right? Well, given a list, it's going to iterate over each of the items in that list. In our case, the individual lines in that list but it also returns the index value of where this item was inside the list. So we should expect that we'll get uh, a zero back because lists are index or started with index zero. So zero and the line that associates with it, one and the line associated with that, two and the line associated with that. So what I do here is I add one uh, to those index values so that instead of it starting at zero up here, it starts at one. Because when people are looking at it, it makes a little bit more sense to think, okay, line one, this was the first line. Line two, this is the first. Instead of, well, I have a zero up there which lines up with line one, I have a one that actually lines up with line two, you know, so on and so forth. Now, I also do an R strip which we haven't really talked about either, but this is the portion of the string, right? So we're iterating over the list. I'm getting individual strings for each of the lines back into my for loop. And I'm right stripping uh, white space characters off of it. So in my case, I could have put, I want you to strip off the new line character, right? And that would have worked just fine. I would have got the same output. If I don't put this, though, and I run it, now, because each individual line has a new line character and the print function puts a new line character, I end up going twice, which is why I end up having an empty line in between each of my entries, okay? Uh, and if I slide over here, that's what I get, right? So I have an empty line, empty line, empty line. So instead of doing that, if I control Z to get that strip back in there, save it and run it, it makes everything a little bit more compact and it looks a little bit nicer. Okay, so this one wasn't too bad. Like I said, I wrote this one uh, for the students, but you know, you get to see how by combining some of these other things, we can make our output look a little bit nicer. Uh, and by using read lines, I can get individual lines. Now, what would have happened had I just used read? Well, we could expect that read would return a string. So what happens to a string when I give it to enumerate? Well, again, enumerate is going to uh, try to uh, move it's going to try to iterate over individual elements within that. Well, what are the individual elements in a string? Well, they're characters, right? So if I would have done this as uh, just read, instead of getting this nice output like this, I instead get each of the individual characters. So now these are almost, instead of line counts, these are character counts, right? So I see I space, B-E-T for bet, space, Y-O-U for you, and so on and so forth, right? So it doesn't really make sense to do it that way, but this is, in essence, now counting some of the characters, right? We'll put it back to read lines, and if I, I think I have to hit the X to clear, there we go, run it, I get my nicer output back, okay? So that's read lines. Read lines returns uh, a list of strings. All right, so the next one uh, is main four. The main four was a bit tricky, right? We covered some some interesting output or aspects uh, in this one. So let's delete our main. We will rename this one as main. I will get rid of my text file.
Okay, so what is this thing going to do? All right, well, we have a function called test image. Uh, and this function is going to test an image to find out if it's a GIF, JPEG, or PNG. Now, you might call this GIF, and I would say you're wrong, but that's all right. We can still be friends. I'm going to call it a GIF. I'm going to call this a JPEG, and I'm going to call this a PNG. So whatever you want to call it, you can do. That's fine. Now, down here at the bottom, all we're doing here, and we haven't really talked about importing modules too much, uh, but essentially, I have the sys module. And if I go all the way to the top, I have imported sys, right? So this is a, uh, a module built into the standard Python library, so standard library. And in that, there is something called argv, which essentially equates to these are the command line arguments that you gave me when you ran the program. So let's look to see what that looks like. So if I block this out, and I just print out sys.argv. All right, so it should be pretty simple. Now, because I'm talking about the command line, I can't use this console portion, right? The REPL here. Instead, I'm going to use the shell, right? And so I have my main program here. And I'm going to say Python 3, go ahead and exit or execute main.py. And so now what I get in sys.argv is a list that right now only contains main.py, the name of the program that I executed. So if I up arrow and put something, notice here I have a list that not only has the name of the program that I executed, but the first argument that I gave that program. And if I were to put something else, I have main, something, and something else, right? So it's going to break up each of these uh, elements and put them in a uh, list for me. So I'm taking the easy way out here, not bringing in something like arg parse or you know whatever or click. There's a couple different modules that I can use for command line arguments, and I'm just going to say, hey, if the length of sysargv is two, go ahead and do something. Otherwise, print out some type of usage statement. So what does that kind of look like? So we already know the first element is always going to be the name of our program. So if there are two elements, I'm expecting that they gave me one thing. Not two things, one thing, right? So if I get rid of this, and I get rid of this, and save it, and I go back up, and I've typed in all of that stuff, it's going to say, hey, that's, that's the wrong way to run my program. You're crazy. I want you to type in python3 main.py and some file name, right? So we should do something like that. And then it seems to be happy, right? And that's because we haven't filled out this function to actually do anything useful. But essentially, it matched length to, it saved off the name of the image. So it should have saved off something because we're using index value one. So this would have been 0, 1, right? So we're taking that uh, index value 1, saving it off in a variable called image, and we're passing that to our test image function. So now we need to take that image and bring it in and open it as read and binary. Okay, so... We're no longer working with text files. We're going to work with binary. So this is probably a good time for us to go ahead and upload some of our images. So I'm going to I have a robot something. And notice here that typically we have an extension on the end that indicates what the file is, right? So robot.something1. So this is obviously not a good file extension. However, my computer's smart enough to say, hey, I recognize that. That's this cool looking robot, right? Well, how did it do that? Because that doesn't make sense. Because 
I mean, Windows may have evolved a little bit, but the Windows operating system would have problems doing that. And definitely this REPL has some problems doing that because it doesn't know what to do with this. So it displays all this craziness, right? What this actually is, is it's trying to represent this as a text file, right? Because it doesn't recognize this extension. But notice here, GIF. That's probably a good indicator that this is a GIF, right? So if I go back to my terminal and I look at robot.something, I can give the file command. This is a Linux machine. Your, your machine might be different. So I've got robot.something1. It knows this is also a GIF. So more than likely it's doing something by looking for this pattern and deciding this is a GIF. And if you thought that, you're correct. We call these magic numbers, right? in that the file program is supposed to recognize all sorts of different types of files by looking at the header, basically these first couple of bytes or whatever, to try to recognize what it's looking at. So if I use another program called XXD, I can give this robot dot something, pass this into less so that it slows down, usually helps if you name the file correctly. And notice here we have GIF again, right? So this is kind of looking like the output that we saw in the REPL uh, IT interface. But this displays the hexadecimal values on the left and then the ASCII equivalent. Remember, we talked about ASCII before uh, on the right. And so notice here, 47, 49, 46. So keep that in your head, 47, 49, 46, All right? So I quit out of that and I bring up my ASCII chart again. 47, 49. All right, we have to get to the hexadecimal. I'm starting to look at the decimals. So 47, G, 49, I, or six F. So now we have our G, I, and an F, right? Why is this important? Well, I can read in those bytes from the file and then see if I can match it against G, I, F to see if I found, in fact, a GIF image. So let's do that. So if we come back here of our main program, let's go ahead and with open, and this is image, and I'm gonna do an RB. So I'm reading it as a binary file as my image, whatever I wanna call it, colon, right? So we passed it in as a variable called image. I receive it as a variable, name it image again. And so all I'm doing is opening that. So I'm expecting that this is a file name. And I'm now opening it, saving off the file descriptor in my image. And I'm going to read the first four bytes. Now, I could read in less than that. I could read in the entire thing. But we're just going to grab the first four bytes. And that's because as we start looking at JPEGs, GIFs, and PNGs, we're gonna find that, at least in the case of P and G, I need at least four bytes to identify it. And the, the way that I've found this is you can go and look to see what is a standard header format for certain types of files. So I happened to cross a couple different websites to give the breakdown. So in our case, we're starting with our uh, GIF and they're saying, hey, 474946, that's the same thing we saw in XXD earlier, right? And then there's additional information in here, you know, the width of the, you know, thing, height, you know, all those kinds of things, right? So there's different information that's embedded in here, but 
For now, all we're going to care about is these first three bytes, 474946. All right, so if I come back to my REPL, I'm going to find that uh, I can, in fact, look for the hexadecimal values. But for now, we'll just say uh, magic equals read, or how about my image dot read, and I'm going to grab four bytes of that. And now I'm going to go ahead and do a comparison of the byte string to determine the type of image. So what does byte string mean? Well, I read brings back a string, but I'm reading in bytes. So let's first just print out what we got. So magic, we're going to print magic. So I've got robot something one. So I'm going to do Python three main.py robot dot something one. And notice here, I have a B in front and I have G I F eight, right? So because I'm printing it, and this is a byte string, it knows that this lines up with an ASCII value. So I can do then a comparison to just these ASCII values if I want. Now, I could also do a comparison with the hexadecimal values for it as well, 474946, or I could look for GIF, All right? So let's look at that. So I will do if magic is equal to, I'll do my little byte string, GIF print, uh, we'll do the file name is a, GIF is a GIF. We'll do format. We could have done an F string here, um, but we'll just do it this way. Well, let's not. So we have with Python three GIFs or uh, F strings. And we'll just call this our image. And so let's give this a try. So we have a syntax error. Uh, where do we have it? Line 25. So I have made a mistake in I did not close my print statement. All right. Now I printed out GIF, but then I didn't print anything else after that. So why is that? Let's look. We'll do else print. We'll do this as an F string as well. Image not a gif and we'll run this hit escape it's off my screen i'm gonna up arrow no i don't want to display all of that up arrow okay so first it's saying robot dot something one is not a gif hmm why is that well the reason is is i read in or bytes so I have this extra eight character, remember, uh, at the end, but I'm only comparing it to this. So if I were to cut this down to three characters and run it, it would in fact work. So robot something is a GIF, but I want to read in four characters so that I can also do these PNGs. So I want to go back to four characters and instead of when I do this comparison, I'm gonna chop off one of the characters. And to do that, I'm gonna use a slice, right? So a slice is a way for me to grab certain index positions, you know, like a group of index positions uh, in this uh, byte string, right? And the way I do that is by specifying a range of index values. So I could say zero, because I wanna start at the very beginning, and I wanna go up to but not including index three. So this will be index value zero, index value one, and index value two, right? So three characters total, right? So now if I run that, it's going to lie to me and tell me that it's not a GIF. Why not? You're being mean to me. 
being too mean to me. So let's try it right there. More than likely, it is. Oh, it says it is GIF. I don't know. Maybe I didn't save it or something. But that's weird because I didn't change it down here and it now matches. So I probably just didn't save it. Let's save that. Hit up arrow, run it. Okay. So it is a GIF. All right. You're not lying to me anymore. It's probably just I didn't hit save. All right. So now we can match a GIF, not a GIF, a GIF. And just for those of you who get triggered, I'll do an L if magic. And now for a JPEG, I'm going to go with three characters again. So zero colon three equal to and in this case i also have a byte string but i can't necessarily put the ascii values i have to put the hexadecimal values so if i copy this and paste this and how did i find this i went on the internet and looked and saw that hey uh for most jpegs here you'll get ffd8ff right so not something i pulled out of my head Something, you know, you just Google, right? And so I found FFD8FF should indicate that this is, in fact, a JPEG. So now, if it doesn't match, we'll print is not a GIF or JPEG. So let's try that. So let's see. GIFs still work. If I give it something wrong, so if I'm going to give it main.py to read in, it grabs the first couple characters off of that, which happens to be right there. All right? So we end up with pound, exclamation, slash, and U. So... That is not a GIF or a JPEG. So let's upload a JPEG, which I'm assuming one of these is a JPEG. So let's just go ahead and upload all of them. So let's see. We tried main dot or robot something one. Let's try robot something two. So robot dot something two is not a GIF or a JPEG. So how about three? Well, it says robot.something3 is a JPEG. So let's double check that file. Robot.something3. My file program also says that is a JPEG. So cool stuff. All right, so the last one now is PNG. So it's going to look very similar to what we have in here, except instead of looking uh, for the first three, we're going to skip a character and just look for PNG. Now I could look for x89 PNG and that would be fine too. L if magic, let's do that. That'll make it a little bit easier on us. We don't have to do another slice. We'll do slash x89 PNG colon, let me copy this line. Oh man. Too many spaces. Image is a PNG. So now if it doesn't match, it's not a GIF. Come on, computer. JPEG or PNG. So let's try this again. So main dot something three it can still identify that something two it now says is a png and something one is a gif and if i give it something arbitrary it's going to say it's neither uh is not a gif jpeg or png now i haven't done any kind of protections here so i could put garbage and it's going to give me an error saying hey file not found we could do some exception handling at some point, but the point is here is that our program does work, 
right? It's able to successfully identify a GIF, uh, a JPEG, and a PNG. Now, if I wanted to cut off this first character, I could do so with a, another slice. So instead of starting at a one position, I could start or at index zero, I could start at index one and go up to, but not including the fourth character, all right? And so if I save that, it should not work right now. So which one was it? Was it the second one? So now it can't match the PNG. If I cut that off, I do in fact get a PNG, right? And so that was pretty much where we stopped uh, as far as the meetup for today, because uh, that took us long enough and it probably took me long enough to, to kind of recount uh, or rewalk through this kind of stuff. Uh, but now you see how we can open up a file. Uh, we can close a file. We can read from it, whether it's a text file or a binary file. Um, and now that it's a binary file, we have other things to consider. Uh, the fact that it's now a byte string uh, that we read in. Uh, and it becomes important to maybe not read in the entire file, but to instead read in, you know, just the number of bytes that we need to do what it is that we need, right? So in this case, just to identify the type of file uh, by writing, reading in just the first couple of bytes. So I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, I hope uh, you have fun uh, opening files, exploring files, uh, some of the command line tools that I use today, hopefully, uh, you know, spark some interest in maybe learning a little bit more about Linux, more about the command line, so that you can have cool programs like ASCII, File, XXD, Less, you know, stuff like that that we used. So again, thank you for those of you who showed up today. Uh, I hope, again, it was informative and uh, I will see you guys later.